All righty. Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks to Eric for getting us pretty much back on schedule here this morning. Um, and also for helping me continue our streak of both being based in Toronto and never seeing each other there. Um, so my name's Stephen Gordon. I'm a product manager at Red Hat uh, in the OpenStack group, uh, focused on user workloads, uh, so both compute, um, but also how we integrate uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, with OpenStack, uh, which runs into some of the topics we've already heard about this morning. Um, so today, I'm speaking on behalf of the Red Hat uh, Performance and Scale team uh, and going through some of the results they've had when testing Kubernetes um, on OpenStack clusters. Um, so for those who are at Barcelona, uh, they may have caught or even seen on the CNCF blog uh, the outcome of part one of this kind of testing. Um, so just as a quick recap, um, in, those testing, in that testing, uh, we ran up a 1,000 node uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, so Kubernetes 1.3, and just to act as a translation layer uh, to the OpenShift versioning, so OpenShift Container Platform 3.3 that we used at that point in time is based around Kubernetes 1.3. Uh, and then similarly, uh, the part two that I'll be talking about today uses OpenShift Container Platform 3.5, uh, so that translates to Kubernetes version 1.5. Um, and as a result, many of the outcomes of that and the improvements you can already start to see in Kubernetes 1.6 coming out of that. Um, so at the time, the identified goals of this exercise, uh, first of all, uh, we always want to validate that we can get the same results uh, that we got when we were working with the upstream community in the con uh, construct of the scalability special interest group in the Kubernetes community. Um, we want to push the system to its limit um, and ensure, when we're ensuring we reproduce that work. And we want to identify um, both best practices uh, but also any configuration changes that we can bake in uh, in terms of deployment of Kubernetes or OpenShift. Uh, and then finally, uh, documenting and uh, filing any issues we find in the relevant upstream communities. Uh, and a very important thing to highlight here is we're not just talking about Kubernetes and OpenStack communities here. Um, in this work, we found uh, various bugs and issues across uh, things like the kernel, OpenV switch, Ceph, Ansible, etcd, um, there's a whole gamut of open source projects that are involved in making uh, a Kubernetes and an OpenStack cluster work, uh, and especially work together. Um, so we're talking about improving all of those um, via this. Um, and then ultimately, of course, trying to fix these issues in those upstreams. So for part two, um, the first thing we wanted to focus on was raising uh, the number of uh, Kubernetes uh, nodes we're talking about here. Uh, so we're talking about running to 2048 uh, Kubernetes nodes on top of OpenStack. Um, we did also do some side-by-side -side testing uh, for a control group with a smaller cluster that was on bare metal. Um, and that gives us some interesting insight into kind of where the differences are or aren't, uh, particularly when we're talking about some of the networking layers, uh, depending on whether we're working on bare metal or virtual machines. Um, we also wanted to do some more specific testing this time around. Uh, so doing uh, saturation testing of the HA proxy-based uh, network ingress tier. Um, testing of the overlay to graph dri driver uh, with SE Linux. Uh, so that's a relatively um, new feature that you can use that with SE Linux at all. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we're combining pieces of software to actually get that at the moment. Um, and then finally, uh, talking about persistent volume scalability um, and performance in the context of uh, container native storage, uh, which is a Gluster FS based solution. Um, and then implicitly in all of this, we're also, of course, saturation testing uh, the various auxiliary systems in OpenShift and Kubernetes, uh, so things like the registry and CI-CD pipelines uh, that we use to deploy applications. Um, in terms of the upstream landscape, uh, so for folks who aren't familiar, uh, the Kubernetes community is organized somewhat loosely around uh, special interest groups. Um, these, I would phrase, compared to a, or our position compared to an OpenStack project, they're kind of in between um, the OpenStack projects and the working groups is kind of a mix of both. Um, they do take ownership often of various areas of the code. Um, but they also um, take ownership of some of the areas around those as well. Uh, so in the context of scalability, uh, the scalability SIG um, has some SLAs in terms of what it means for an application to be responsive, uh, because of course it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to come out and say how many thousand um, instances I can run or how many thousand containers if those containers aren't actually responsive or, the, um, or if the rest of the interface is um, going so slowly that I don't have a responsive system or a useful system. Um, so in terms of API responsiveness, 99% uh, of calls uh, to the Kubernetes API returning in less than one second. Um, in terms of pod startup time, 99% being up within five seconds. 
Um, I should note the asterisk there is important. So when we talk about the pod startup, we're talking about with pre-pulled images uh, because we're trying to isolate and ensure we're testing Kubernetes itself, um, not testing the variability of our um, storage network in particular. Um, so one of the questions that I think is coming up a lot of late, and we heard a little bit of talk about this in the keynote today and in Eric's presentation just before mine, um, is about why I combine um, infrastructure as a service and uh, an application tier like uh, Kubernetes. Um, and the way I think of it is in terms of exposition and consumption of resources. So if I think about a single host, um, traditionally the Linux, uh, Linux kernel has been responsible for taking uh, CPU hardware, uh, CPU disk memory, and exposing that to you for consumption by user space processes. When I scale that out to a distributed system, uh, I still need something to provision systems and uh, expose their resources, and those may be hardware or virtual increasingly, so when we think about software-defined networking, for example. Um, and then Kubernetes is what allows me to have a translation layer that effectively, um, effectively communicates between the application and the underlying infrastructure without my application itself having to be tied to that infrastructure. Um, one of the other things, and you'll note uh, when I open that we're talking about running OpenShift and Kubernetes in a virtual machines at this stage uh, for most of this testing, although there was some bare metal testing as well. Um, and it's interesting because I think it's a reflection of where we are currently, um, that that is the reality of most of the production deployments of Kubernetes we're seeing at the moment, um, but not necessarily where it's going. Uh, so what's going to be interesting, I think, is this week, and particularly in the keynote demos tomorrow, you're going to see people breaking down uh, the monolith um, that is OpenStack into kind of what, which projects are still useful um, in, this kind of, in this environment where I'm running Kubernetes potentially on uh, OpenStack managed bare metal. Um, you know, some of the examples mentioned, uh, Neutron Cinder is potentially interesting. Uh, there are others. And it's kind of uh, a model that's a little bit in conflict with what Eric was talking about with the sandwich and a little bit of a different way of thinking of maybe I'm not building a sandwich with Kubernetes, OpenStack Kubernetes. Maybe I'm building a bare metal compute pool, uh, which might be managed using something like Ironic, um, some of which is running OpenStack for the purposes of running VMs, some of which is running Kubernetes directly on that metal, um, but potentially using some of those shared services to communicate in a complex application. Um, I think the fact that we're also, the other factor in why people are mostly running it in VMs at the moment, I think, is more people and culture. Um, and it was mentioned today, uh, we had Red Hat Summit last week and a lot of good customer conversations at that event. Um, but just to give you um, the kind of, you have this breadth of where people are coming from, where some people are you know, all in uh, building greenfield applications on OpenShift. Uh, and the other end of the scale, you have people who are currently at the point where their IT organization wants them to run one container per VM um, because of concerns about isolation, uh, which you know, we can argue and discuss about whether those concerns are real, because we, we use SE Linux in a similar fashion to isolate against the unlikely event of a hypervisor breakout, for example, when we talk about virtual machines. Um, but regardless, there are people and culture challenges there and um, getting acceptance to the point where you can run um, Kubernetes on bare metal in some organizations. And it's also just a factor of the way IT has developed in the preceding 10 to 15 years, where in a lot of organizations, it's now easier to cons consume a virtual machine than it is to actually get your hands on bare metal hardware. Um, these are all things OpenStack can help with and Kubernetes as well. Um, so in terms of thinking about Kubernetes, uh, Red Hat is obviously a big contributor um, to Kubernetes. Uh, we build OpenShift uh, v3 around it, um, and that is what we'll be using um, to test in this, or what we use to test in this exercise. Um, so this is an integrated platform built around Docker and Kubernetes, um, building on top of that and providing workflows for CI/CD and for building it and pushing code to production. Um, so when we put this together at the moment, uh, the way this typically works is we have our application or our software layer at the top. Uh, we have um, OpenShift providing the application platform uh, based on Kubernetes in the middle. Um, and then it has, via the cloud provider implementation in Kubernetes, uh, the ability to talk to un the underlying cloud. And when my application requests a persistent volume claim, for example, um, that layer knows how to translate that into either a call to Cinder in the OpenStack case, a call to EBS in the Amazon case, and so on. Um, so we're maintaining the technical independence of our application uh, while also providing this contextual awareness um, to allow um, to make the best use of the available infrastructure. 
Um, there is a re published reference architecture around this, um, which is available at that link, and these slides I should mention I'll send out afterwards as well. Um, but now I want to get into the meat of the actual performance of scale testing we did. So the first thing that comes up when you're talking about uh, doing any kind of perf or scale testing is where do you want to test? Uh, we have a couple of different approaches to this available to us. Uh, so Red Hat does have its own scale lab. Uh, we also have the opportunity to work with partners in some of their labs from time to time. Uh, in this particular case, we're, work we're working with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, so they have a 1,000 node uh, cluster um, provided by Intel uh, for use by the CNCF community. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we're focused on primarily the OpenShift and Kubernetes testing. Uh, so the OpenStack cluster itself is around 300 nodes um, to run those 2,048 VMs that we put on top of it. Um, in terms of the compute node and storage node specs that are displayed here, um, Nothing that I would say is too important to focus in on, except that I will mention um, these compute nodes did have an NVMe uh, PCIe SSD available. Um, and just as we did in the previous round of testing, we actually made uh, direct use of these, um, which I'll come to when I get to the container native storage piece uh, later in this presentation. Uh, in terms of how to test, uh, so the Red Hat Performance and Scale team have a set of tools uh, in what we call the system verification test suite. Um, and these include things for testing uh, or metering application performance, um, performance and scalability of the OpenShift via the OpenShift web UI, um, scalability, networking performance, and reliability and longevity for things that we need to run over uh, a longer period of time, say weeks. Um, it also includes some tools like the image provi provisioner, uh, which is a set of Ansible playbooks um, for doing that preloading of the image uh, with the OpenShift pieces in particular. Uh, so that, again, we're using Im the, an image that's been pre-baked with everything we need uh, so that we're focusing on what we want to test in terms of performance rather than our storage network or the performance of our storage network. Um, so in terms of what we actually deployed, uh, so I mentioned we had the 300 nodes of OpenStack. Uh, we put the 2048 VMs on top of that. Um, we also had this other bare metal cluster uh, where we did just 100 nodes uh, of OpenShift on bare metal. Um, in terms of how we actually deployed that, uh, we're using uh, Red Hat OpenStack Platform 10, which is based on Newton. Uh, the previous testing that I reported in Barcelona was, if I recall correctly, based on 8. Uh, we're using OpenShift Container Platform 3.5 early access builds. Um, so those are built around Kubernetes 1.5. And we're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, 7.3. I say mostly um, because when it comes to the Overlay 2 plus SE Linux testing, uh, we were actually using a RHEL 7.4 preview kernel uh, for that purpose as well. Uh, and I'll get into that in more detail in a second. Um, for the deployment, uh, we were deploying OpenStack and Ceph using Triple O, um, which, which we call Director in the context of the product. Uh, we're deploying OpenShift Container Platform um, using the playbooks in the OpenShift Ansible pro project. Uh, we also applied some previous learnings in terms of how we went about doing this. Uh, so in terms of storage, uh, each of the storage nodes included two SSDs and 10 SAS disks. Um, we found that, uh, or we know that Ceph performs uh, significantly better when deployed with the write journal on SSDs. Um, so we made use of the SSDs um, to create two write journals um, and allocated five of the spinning disks to each of those. Um, so in all, in all we had uh, 90 Ceph OSDs, um, and that enabled us to have 158 terabytes of available disk space. Um, we also, um, the NVMEs uh, for the container native storage testing, uh, so those appear as a PCI device on the box, uh, so we're able to use the PCI pass-through functionality um, that's been in OpenStack since something like Havana um, to pass those directly to the VMs where we wanted to run nodes uh, with the container native storage facility. Um, and that's using the commonly available PCI pass-through feature. Uh, we also, uh, through management of the image upload process um, and ensuring that we were converting to raw uh, before we uploaded, um, we were able to consume a lot less disk space um, than we did last time around. Um, so we used only 1.5 terabytes um, instead of 22 terabytes uh, for twice as many VMs and also brought our uh, boot times down quite a bit. So our, our 2048 VMs this time out, uh, we managed to boot in 15 minutes. Um, and we're using here a snapshot uh, slash boot from volume process to do that and to get some efficiency there. All right, so in terms of uh, network ingress and routing, um, so the routing tier in OpenShift uh, consists largely of nodes running HAProxy for ingress into the cluster. Um, 
We identified that on average, uh, we get a large number of low throughput uh, connections. Um, typically, a lot of the applications or the greenfield applications we see are more uh, web-based or transactional in nature. Um, so we weren't really looking for a small number of high throughput connections in this testing. Um, and we've already made some improvements in this space based on the previous iterations of testing. Uh, so for example, the default connection limit of 2,000 um, was leaving plenty of available room uh, on the CPUs of these boxes. Uh, so that's actually been bumped to 20,000 in OpenShift 3.5 out of the box. Um, so we're already applying some of the learnings we've had in this space. Um, the other thing is that it's now much easier um, as of OpenShift 3.4, I think, uh, to customize the routing layer um, because you can now feed it with a config map, uh, which makes that easier. Um, the load generator itself is also configured using a config map, uh, an example which is on the right here. Um, it queries uh, the Kubernetes API for a list of routes. Um, it then builds the list of targets from that dynamically. Um, and what we did was we zoomed in on a particular workload mix, um, combination of HTTP with Keepalive, uh, and also um, TLS work workloads. Uh, and again, because that's re representative of what we see in, um, in our field deployed customers where um, they have a mix of applications serving both internal and external users and therefore have a variety of different um, security contexts in which they want to run those. Um, so in terms of graphing those and just walking through the scenarios here, um, so the graph itself uh, shows a throughput test um, and on the y-axis uh, we're talking about uh, request per second, um, so higher is better. Um, and in terms of the scenarios listed on the left, um, so the NB proc, um, that refers to the number of HA proxy processes. Um, further down the list, uh, the shared migration cost, um, that is a kernel tunable, um, or not a kernel tunable, tunable sorry, but a tunable um, that allows us to um, tell the kernel um, how and when it should load balance um, amongst available cores. Uh, and we use that in one of these scenarios here as well. Um, and the final thing, um, or well, not the final thing, but as we go through this, if we look at the, um, the graphs here, um, some of the interesting things, so CPU affinity did matter. Uh, so if we look at our first scenario, we're running on any CPU, um, second bar, run on core zero, run on core one, run on core two, and so on. Um, so those uh, core, core zero through three, those are pinned scenarios. Um, what you notice though, when you're looking at these, is we got a significant boost uh, in these examples on pinning on the core zero and on core two, uh, but not necessarily on core one. And the reason for that is actually locality to the PCI device that's doing the network um, or the network traffic. Um, so when we had that, we get even, uh, even more significant performance boost or significant performance boost at, at, at least. Um, with the NB proc setting, um, there was an impact uh, when we talk about increasing it to two. Uh, so we did, as you would expect, get almost you know, roughly double out of that. Um, but interestingly, when you go to four, um, that didn't really scale that way. And the reason for that is that the guest in question only had four vCPUs. Uh, so in effect, if you have four HA proxy processes um, busy, um, you're not leaving any room on that particular guest um, for anything else to happen, any of the host processes that need to, need to schedule as well. Um, so the biggest thing actually was, um, you know, of all of these things, the biggest thing was that shared migration cost. Um, Solely by changing that, we were able to get a 20% improvement from the baseline, um, and that's something um, that we'll be doing in the future. Um, it's also a, a, common, um, low, a common technique with low, low latency networking, uh, and will inclu be included in the guide that I'm gonna mention at the end uh, that came out of some of this work. Um, the other thing I should mention was, um, so with, with regards to that shared migration cost and the reason it makes a difference, um, by keeping the, keeping the HA proxy uh, process on the core for longer, uh, we're basically increasing the chances that we're gonna hit the uh, host CPU cache um, for that core. All right, in terms of general networking uh, and a bit of an overview, uh, so OpenShift includes and uses uh, OpenShift SDN by default. Uh, this is a solution built around Open vSwitch and VXLAN. Um, it provides full multi-tenancy. Um, and it provides full multi-tenancy across any of the footprints where we support OpenShift. So that includes uh, physical, virtual infrastructure, private cloud, public cloud. Um, the downside of that, of course, in the context of OpenStack is you're often already running um, some kind of underlay ne overlay networking, sorry, uh, on the infrastructure. Um, so this means we're running with double encapsulation. Um, 
and I'll go into the kind of uh, nuances of that a little bit when we go to the results. Um, the other thing I should mention, though, is that that layer is fully pluggable, um, as is the network ingress layer. Uh, and in future, and one of the things we're working on is Project Courier uh, as a potential way to have that layer or the networking layer uh, in Kubernetes talk directly to the OpenStack networking. Uh, and that's something we're excited about for the future. Um, again, we're talking about web-based workloads that are mainly transactional based on what we see in the field. Uh, so we focused on a micro benchmark, um, so a ping pong test of varying payload sizes. Um, so the pur purpose of trying to make this readable, I've tried to pair these up a little bit. Um, but in effect, each of these groupings are notated by the arrows. Um, so the first pair is uh, testing with 64-byte packets. Second pair is testing with 1,024-byte packets. And then the last one with 16,384-byte packets. Um, the difference within each pair uh, between the first and second group of bars uh, is that in the first case, uh, we have just one stream. And in the second case, we increase that to four streams. Um, in terms of the colors of the bars, so we tested here from a variety of points, so from bare metal itself, um, bare metal plus pod, um, VM, VM plus pod. Um, and what's interesting is when we talk about uh, you know, looking at the first pair, um, the differences um, when we add streams, obviously, we get a big boost, as we would expect. Um, so when we go from one stream to four streams. Um, but there's not a lot of difference across bare metal versus bare metal plus pod versus VM and so on. Uh, those bars are relatively aligned uh, within their group. What we see, though, is as we start increasing the packet size or increasing the payload size um, in the later bars, so it's, it's a, a minimal extent with the 1,024 bytes, but certainly when we get up to um, 16,000 plus, um, there's quite a lot of um, degradation in the VM and VM plus pod case uh, versus straight bare metal, um, which is Somewhat to be expected, uh, but still something we'd, we needed to validate. Um, in terms of tuning, uh, so one bonus tuning thing I should mention. Uh, so when you'd have uh, over 1,000 routes, uh, or routes, sorry, um, or the, on the node, we needed to increase, increase the uh, kernel upcache size. Uh, so we've actually increased that by a factor of eight um, in the out-of-the-box tuning for OpenShift 3.5. All right, the last thing, or the last category of tests I want to talk about uh, is storage. Um, so first of all, um, for those who aren't familiar, in RHEL um, until recently, and actually it's still the default at the moment, uh, we used Device Mapper uh, for Docker storage graph driver. Um, overlay support was added as an option in 7.2, um, overlay, overlay 2 in 7.3. Um, and the main reasons that we stuck to Device Mapper thus far are for maturity, supportability, um, security. So in particular, we were unable until very recently to run the overlay, um, overlay drivers uh, with SE Linux enabled, and also POSIX compliance. Uh, what you're getting, though, when you trade those things off uh, to use the overlay graph drivers um, is density improvements um, by sharing page caches, um, which is particularly valuable if you have a common base image or a large percentage of your base image is common. Um, so for testing this, so we actually have landed in the upstream Linux kernel as a 4.9. Um, the change is to allow us to support overlay 2 with SE Linux enabled, um, which Dan makes Dan Walsh very happy, which makes all of us very happy. Um, so Device Mapper is going to remain the default in RHEL, but in 7.4 you will be able to use overlay 2 with SE Linux. Uh, we actually used a preview of that kernel uh, for the subsequent testing of this graph driver. Um, and what you'll see is in Fedora 26, it's planned to make um, overlay t to the default. Uh, and for folks familiar with that development process, that will eventually funnel down to RHEL as the default as well. So in terms of testing this out, um, we again used the cluster loader, uh, which basically uh, is one of those tools from the SVT um, repository, which allows us to bulk load a heap of Kubernetes objects at once, or as in this case, we staggered them. Um, so we're using a single base image, which, as I mentioned, is you know, nominally the best case scenario for the overlay graph drivers. Um, and um, earlier, Eric mentioned uh, the upper limit on pods per node is 110. I think that was actually a previous limit, because it's now 250 in the more recent versions of Kubernetes. Um, so we ran up 240 pods on the node. Um, we rate limited the creation. So the, the bumps you see in the line are batches of 40, if I remember correctly. Um, so we create 40 pods check they're there and working, and then we create another 40 pods. Um, and as you expect, as we go through this, um, you get a, de a reasonable memory saving in the overlay 2 case, um, because, sorry, overlay 2 is the lower line. So 
as, as you create more and more pods, you're getting uh, more of a saving here in memory. Um, but more importantly, uh, as you would expect based on the caching, uh, you have a, a, a little blip at the start there when we load the image for the first time in the overlay case in red. Um, but you're saving significantly on uh, IOPS for versus uh, device mapper, um, which obviously continues to need to um, make those reads. Um, in general, we found that uh, the overlay 2 stuff um, was pretty stable. And of course, we were able to use that with SE Linux, which makes it more compelling and reduces some of the trade-offs um, in using that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is the container-native storage testing we did. Um, so OpenShift Container Platform and Kubernetes itself um, supports a wide variety of volume providers uh, via the volume plugin mechanism. Um, container-native storage is a cluster-based solution uh, that can plug into that. Um, but the idea is that it itself is running on OpenShift. Um, why would you want to do that? Um, so if you imagine you have your uh, cloud provider, you have some number of uh, physical volumes attached to that, um, so from EBS or Cinder in the OpenStack case. And sometimes there are limitations on how many of those you can actually attach to a guest. Um, Container-native storage is aimed at taking those, um, plumbing from those a larger number of volumes uh, for an application, a larger number of smaller volumes, and ideally co-locating the storage with the application. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we're separating them out uh, for the purposes of isolating uh, what we're doing. So the, the nodes where we deployed uh, the container-native storage piece, we isolated them from the actual workloads because we want to ensure we're just testing the performance of those. Um, so we marked those unschedulable for other workloads. Um, these nodes, again, are the ones where we had plumbed through the NVMe disks directly to the instance. And then we're exposing one gigabyte volumes from those. Um, as persistent volumes for Kubernetes applications to use. Um, from that, we ran through throughput numbers for create and delete operations, as well as um, checking on API parallel parallelism. Um, and what we were really checking for here is um, to ensure that it behaved in the same way um, that we see other volume providers for Kubernetes pr um, behave, which is we wanted to ensure that we're allocating volumes in constant time. Um, so what we found was that we take roughly six seconds from submit um, to, of the persistent volume claim um, to having that bound to our container. Um, and that's a constant over time. Um, the number didn't change for bare metal versus virtualized. Uh, that was consistent. Um, and we did do other tests of other providers, uh, not shown here, to validate that we got the same results. Um, and as you can see, we gradually scale up on the right towards uh, 700 plus um, persistent volumes bound. Um, I want to talk a little bit about next steps. Uh, so out of this round two of this exercise, the OpenShift 3.5 testing, uh, we filed 40 plus bugs across a number of projects and components. So again, not just Kubernetes and OpenStack, but also Docker, Ceph, uh, Kernel, OpenVSwitch, even Golang. Um, obviously, uh, our aim is to try and fix as many of those pos as possible in the relevant upstream communities and get those into product. Uh, many of those, that's already happened. Others we'll see in future iterations. Um, there is also now, with OpenShift Container Platform 3.5, and this is publicly accessible and also relevant to Kubernetes users as well, um, a scaling and performance guide, which is available on the uh, Red Hat website at access.redhat.com. Um, in terms of getting involved, uh, so if there's any folks here operating Kubernetes on OpenStack or interested in operating Kubernetes on OpenStack, um, there is a forum session on Wednesday uh, that I'll be facilitating along with a couple of other people aimed at gathering feedback uh, about, you know, how that's working, what you would like to see um, in future from that combination. Um, we also, I mentioned the scalability SIG, uh, which is where the upstream Kubernetes community interested in scale and perf um, coalesces. Uh, we also have a, a SIG uh, specifically dedicated to OpenStack and the integration uh, that we have there. Um, currently, that's largely focused around um, both the cloud provider framework implementation for Kubernetes talking to OpenStack um, which is somewhat monolithic in nature, and you'll be hearing later this week about various uh, ideas for breaking some of that apart and using bits and pieces separately, um, but also as a place for people who are uh, active in the OpenStack deployment using Kubernetes um, projects to um, come together and share some of their conversations as well. Uh, if you're interested in seeing um, OpenShift running on Red Hat with some real applications or some real example applications at least, uh, we do have that running on, down at the booth. Um, so you can go and see that uh, live there as well. Um, and then just to finish up, uh, just a couple of references. I will tweet out these slides um, shortly. Uh, so my Twitter handle is at XS, XS Gordon. 
Um, so you can catch these there. And I should mention uh, in particular uh, that Trello board at the bottom is public, uh, so you can follow what's coming next, basically. And that's it.